Chapter Thirteen of *The Portrait of a Lady* by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was this feeling, and not the wish to ask advice. She had no desire whatever for that, that led her to speak to her uncle of what had taken place. She wished to speak to some one. She should feel more natural, more human, and her uncle, for this purpose, presented himself in a more attractive light than either her aunt or her friend Henrietta. Her cousin, of course, was a possible confidant, but she would have had to do herself violence to air this special secret to Ralph. So the next day, after breakfast, she sought the occasion. Her uncle never left his apartment till the afternoon, but he received his cronies, as he said, in his dressing-room. Isabel had quite taken her place in the class so designated, which, for the rest, included the old man's son, his physician, his personal servant, and even Miss Stackpole. Mrs. Touchett did not figure in the list, and this was an obstacle the less to Isabel's finding her host alone. He sat in a complicated mechanical chair, at the open window of his room, looking westward over the park and the river, with his newspapers and letters piled up beside him, his toilet freshly and minutely made, and his smooth, speculative face composed to benevolent expectation. She approached her point directly. I think I ought to let you know that Lord Warburton has asked me to marry him. I suppose I ought to tell my aunt, but it seems best to tell you first. The old man expressed no surprise, but thanked her for the confidence she showed him. Do you mind telling me whether you accepted him? he then inquired. I've not answered him definitely yet. I've taken a little time to think of it, because that seems more respectful. But I shall not accept him. Mr. Touchett made no comment upon this. He had the air of thinking that, whatever interest he might take in the matter, from the point of view of sociability, he had no active voice in it. Well, I told you you'd be a success over here. Americans are highly appreciated. Very highly indeed, said Isabel, but at the cost of seeming both tasteless and ungrateful, I don't think I can marry Lord Warburton. Well, her uncle went on, of course an old man can't judge for a young lady. I'm glad you didn't ask me before you made up your mind. I suppose I ought to tell you, he added slowly, but as it were not of much consequence, that I've known all about it these three days. About Lord Warburton's state of mind? About his intentions, as they say here. He wrote me a very pleasant letter, telling me all about them. Should you like to see his letter? the old man obligingly asked. Thank you. I don't think I care about that. But I'm glad he wrote to you. It was right that he should, and he would be certain to do what was right. Ah, well, I guess you do like him, Mr. Touchett declared. You needn't pretend you don't. I like him extremely. I'm very free to admit that. But I don't wish to marry anyone just now. You think someone may come along whom you like better? Well, that's very likely, said Mr. Touchett, who appeared to wish to show his kindness to the girl by easing off her decision, as it were, and finding cheerful reasons for it. I don't care if I don't meet anyone else. I like Lord Warburton quite well enough. She fell into that appearance of a sudden change of point of view, with which she sometimes startled and even displeased her interlocutors. Her uncle, however, seemed proof against either of these impressions. "'He's a very fine man,' he resumed in a tone which might have passed for that of encouragement. "'His letter was one of the pleasantest I've received for some weeks. I suppose one of the reasons I liked it was that it was all about you.' That is all except the part that was about himself. I suppose he told you all that. He would have told me everything I wished to ask him, Isabel said. But you didn't feel curious? My curiosity would have been idle once I had determined to decline his offer. You didn't find it sufficiently attractive? Mr. Touchett inquired. She was silent a little. I suppose it was that, she presently admitted, but I don't know why. Fortunately, ladies are not obliged to give reasons, said her uncle. There's a great deal that's attractive about such an idea, 
but I don't see why the English should want to entice us away from our native land. I know that we try to attract them over there, but that's because our population is insufficient. Here, you know, they're rather crowded. However, I presume there's room for charming young ladies everywhere. There seems to have been room here for you, said Isabel, whose eyes had been wandering over the large pleasure spaces of the park. Mr. Touchett gave a shrewd, conscious smile. There's room everywhere, my dear, if you'll pay for it. I sometimes think I've paid too much for this. Perhaps you also might have to pay too much. Perhaps I might, the girl replied. That suggestion gave her something more definite to rest on than she had found in her own thoughts, and the fact of this association of her uncle's mild acuteness with her dilemma seemed to prove that she was concerned with the natural and reasonable emotions of life, and not altogether a victim to intellectual eagerness and vague ambitions, ambitions reaching beyond Lord Warburton's beautiful appeal, reaching to something indefinable and possibly not commendable. In so far as the indefinable had an influence upon Isabel's behaviour at this juncture, it was not the conception, even unformulated, of a union with Caspar Goodwood, for however she might have resisted conquest at her English suitor's large, quiet hands, she was at least as far removed from the disposition to let the young man from Boston take positive possession of her. The sentiment in which she sought refuge after reading his letter was a critical view of his having come abroad, for it was part of the influence he had upon her that he seemed to deprive her of the sense of freedom. There was a disagreeably strong push, a kind of hardness of presence, in his way of rising before her. She had been haunted at moments by the image, by the danger of his disapproval, and had wondered, a consideration she had never paid in equal degree to any one else, whether he would like what she did. The difficulty was that more than any man she had ever known, more than poor Lord Warburton, she had begun now to give his lordship the benefit of this epithet, Caspar Goodwood expressed for her an energy, and she had already felt it as a power, that was of his very nature. It was in no degree a matter of his advantages. It was a matter of the spirit that sat in his clear burning eyes like some tireless watcher at a window. She might like it or not but he insisted ever with his whole weight and force. Even in one's usual contact with him, one had to reckon with that. The idea of a diminished liberty was particularly disagreeable to her at present, since she had just given a sort of personal accent to her independence by looking so straight at Lord Warburton's big bribe, and yet turning away from it. Sometimes Caspar Goodwood had seemed to range himself on the side of her destiny, to be the stubbornest fact she knew. She said to herself at such moments that she might evade him for her time, but that she must make terms with him at last, terms which would be certain to be favourable to himself. Her impulse had been to avail herself of the things that helped her to resist such an obligation, and this impulse had been much concerned in her eager acceptance of her aunt's invitation which had come to her at an hour when she expected from day to day to see Mr. Goodwood, and when she was glad to have an answer ready for something she was sure he would say to her. When she had told him at Albany, on the evening of Mrs. Touchett's visit, that she couldn't then discuss difficult questions, dazzled as she was by the great immediate opening of her aunt's offer of Europe, he declared that this was no answer at all, and it was now to obtain a better one that he was following her across the sea. To say to herself that he was a kind of grim fate was well enough for a fanciful young woman who was able to take much for granted in him, but the reader has a right to a nearer and clearer view. He was the son of a proprietor of well-known cotton mills in Massachusetts, a gentleman who had accumulated a considerable fortune in the exercise of this industry. Casper at present managed the works, and with a judgment and a temper which, in spite of keen competition and languid years, had kept their prosperity from dwindling. He had received the better part of his education at Harvard College, 
where however he had gained renown rather as a gymnast and an oarsman than as a gleaner of more dispersed knowledge later on he had learned that the finer intelligence too could vault and pull and strain might even breaking the record treat itself to rare exploits he had thus discovered in himself a sharp eye for the mystery of mechanics and had invented an improvement in the cotton spinning process which was now largely used and was known by his name you might have seen it in the newspapers in connection with this fruitful contrivance assurance of which he had given to isabel by showing her in the columns of the new york interviewer an exhaustive article on the goodwood patent an article not prepared by miss stackpole friendly as she had proved herself to his more sentimental interests there were intricate bristling things he rejoiced in he liked to organize to contend to administer he could make people work his will believe in him march before him and justify him this was the art as they said of managing men which rested in him further on a bold though brooding ambition it struck those who knew him well that he might do greater things than carry on a cotton factory there was nothing cottony about caspar goodwood and his friends took for granted that he would somehow and somewhere write himself in bigger letters but it was as if something large and confused something dark and ugly would have to call upon him he was not after all in harmony with mere smug peace and greed and gain an order of things of which the vital breath was ubiquitous advertisement it pleased isabel to believe that he might have ridden on a plunging steed the whirlwind of a great war a war like the civil strife that had overdarkened her conscious childhood and his ripening youth she liked at any rate this idea of his being by character and in fact a mover of men liked it much better than some other points in his nature and aspect she cared nothing for his cotton mill the goodwood patent left her imagination absolutely cold she wished him no ounce less of his manhood but she sometimes thought he would be rather nicer if he looked for instance a little differently his jaw was too square and set and his figure too straight and stiff these things suggested a want of easy consonance with the deeper rhythms of life then she viewed with reserve a habit he had of dressing always in the same manner it was not apparently that he wore the same clothes continually for on the contrary his garments had a way of looking rather too new but they all seemed of the same piece the figure the stuff was so drearily usual she had reminded herself more than once that this was a frivolous objection to a person of his importance and then she had amended the rebuke by saying that it would be a frivolous objection only if she were in love with him she was not in love with him and therefore might criticize his small defects as well as his great which latter consisted in the collective reproach of his being too serious or rather not of his being so since one could never be but certainly of his seeming so he showed his appetites and designs too simply and artlessly when one was alone with him he talked too much about the same subject and when other people were present he talked too little about anything and yet he was of supremely strong clean make which was so much she saw the different fitted parts of him as she had seen in museums and portraits the different fitted parts of armoured warriors in plates of steel handsomely inlaid with gold it was very strange where ever was any tangible link between her impression and her act caspar goodwood had never corresponded to her idea of a delightful person and she supposed that this was why he left her so harshly critical when however lord warburton who not only did correspond with it but gave an extension to the term appealed to her approval she found herself still unsatisfied it was certainly strange the sense of her incoherence was not a help to answering mr goodwood's letter and isabel determined to leave it a while unhonoured if he had determined to persecute her he must take the consequences foremost among which was his being left to perceive how little it charmed her that he should come down to garden court she was already liable to the incursions of one suitor at this place 
and though it might be pleasant to be appreciated in opposite quarters, there was a kind of grossness in entertaining two such passionate pleaders at once, even in a case where the entertainment should consist of dismissing them. She made no reply to Mr. Goodwood, but at the end of three days she wrote to Lord Warburton, and the letter belongs to our history. Dear Lord Warburton, a great deal of earnest thought has not led me to change my mind about the suggestion you were so kind to make to me the other day. I am not, I am really and truly not, able to regard you in the light of a companion for life, or to think of your home, your various homes, as the settled seat of my existence. These things cannot be reasoned about, and I very earnestly entreat you not to return to the subject we discussed so exhaustively. We see our lives from our own point of view. That is the privilege of the weakest and humblest of us, and I shall never be able to see mine in the manner you proposed. Kindly let this suffice you, and do me the justice to believe that I have given your proposal the deeply respectful consideration it deserves. It is with this very great regard that I remain sincerely yours, Isabel Archer. While the author of this missive was making up her mind to dispatch it, Henrietta Stackpole formed a resolve which was accompanied by no demur. She invited Ralph Touchett to take a walk with her in the garden, and when he had assented with that alacrity which seemed constantly to testify to his high expectations, she informed him that she had a favour to ask of him. It may be admitted that at this information the young man flinched, for we know that Miss Stackpole had struck him as apt to push an advantage. The alarm was unreasoned, however, for he was clear about the area of her indiscretion as little as advised of his vertical depth, and he made a very civil profession of the desire to serve her. He was afraid of her, and presently told her so. When you look at me in a certain way, my knees knock together, my faculties desert me, I'm filled with trepidation, and I ask only for strength to execute your commands. You've an address that I've never encountered in any woman. Well, Henrietta replied good-humouredly, if I had not known before that you were trying somehow to abash me, I should know it now. Of course I'm easy game. I was brought up with such different customs and ideas. I'm not used to your arbitrary standards, and I've never been spoken to in America as you have spoken to me. If a gentleman conversing with me over there were to speak to me like that, I shouldn't know what to make of it. We take everything more naturally over there, and after all we're a great deal more simple. I admit that. I'm very simple myself. Of course, if you choose to laugh at me for it, you're very welcome. But I think on the whole I would rather be myself than you. I'm quite content to be myself. I don't want to change. There are plenty of people that appreciate me just as I am. It's true they're nice, fresh, free-born Americans. Henrietta had lately taken up the tone of helpless innocence and large concession. "'I want you to assist me a little,' she went on. "'I don't care in the least whether I amuse you while you do so, or rather I'm perfectly willing your amusement should be your reward. I want you to help me about Isabel.' "'Has she injured you?' Ralph asked. "'If she had, I shouldn't mind, and I should never tell you. What I'm afraid of is that she'll injure herself.' "'I think that's very possible,' said Ralph. His companion stopped in the garden walk, fixing on him perhaps the very gaze that unnerved him. "'That, too, would amuse you, I suppose. The way you do say things. I never heard anyone so indifferent.' "'To Isabel? Ah, not that.' "'Well, you're not in love with her, I hope.' "'How can I be when I'm in love with another?' "'You're in love with yourself. That's the other,' Miss Stackpole declared. "'Much good may it do you. But if you wish to be serious once in your life, here's a chance. And if you really care for your cousin, here's an opportunity to prove it. I don't expect you to understand her. That's too much to ask. But you needn't do that to grant my favour. I'll supply the necessary intelligence.' "'I shall enjoy that immensely,' Ralph exclaimed. I'll be Caliban, and you shall be Ariel. 
you're not at all like caliban because you're sophisticated and caliban was not but i'm not talking about imaginary characters i'm talking about isabel isabel's intensely real what i wish to tell you is that i find her fearfully changed since you came do you mean since i came and before i came she's not the same as she once so beautifully was as she was in america yes in america i suppose you know she comes from there she can't help it but she does do you want to change her back again of course i do and i want you to help me ah said ralph i'm only caliban i'm not prospero you were prospero enough to make her what she has become you've acted on isabel archer since she came here mr touchett i my dear miss stackpole never in the world isabel archer has acted on me yes she acts on every one but i've been absolutely passive you're too passive then you had better stir yourself and be careful isabel's changing every day she's drifting away right out to sea i've watched her and i can see it she's not the bright american girl she was she's taking different views a different color and turning away from her old ideals i want to save those ideals mr touchett and that's where you come in not surely as an ideal well i hope not henrietta replied promptly i've got a fear in my heart that she's going to marry one of these fell europeans and i want to prevent it ah i see cried ralph and to prevent it you want me to step in and marry her not quite that remedy would be as bad as the disease for you're the typical the fell european from whom i wish to rescue her no i wish you to take an interest in another person a young man to whom she once gave great encouragement and whom she now doesn't seem to think good enough he's a thoroughly grand man and a very dear friend of mine and i wish very much you would invite him to pay a visit here ralph was puzzled by this appeal and it is perhaps not to the credit of his purity of mind that he failed to look at it first in the simplest light it wore to his eyes a tortuous air and his fault was that he was not quite sure that anything in the world could really be as candid as this request of miss stackpole's appeared that a young woman should demand that a gentleman whom she described as her very dear friend should be furnished with an opportunity to make himself agreeable to another young woman a young woman whose attention had wandered and whose charms were greater this was an anomaly which for the moment challenged all his ingenuity of interpretation to read between the lines was easier than to follow the text and to suppose that miss stackpole wished the gentleman invited to garden court on her own account was the sign not so much of a vulgar as of an embarrassed mind even from this venial act of vulgarity however ralph was saved and saved by a force that i can only speak of as inspiration with no more outward light on the subject than he already possessed he suddenly acquired the conviction that it would be a sovereign injustice to the correspondent of the interviewer to assign a dishonourable motive to any act of hers this conviction passed into his mind with extreme rapidity and it was perhaps kindled by the pure radiance of the young lady's imperturbable gaze he returned this challenge a moment consciously resisting an inclination to frown as one frowns in the presence of larger luminaries who's the gentleman you speak of mr caspar goodwood of boston he has been extremely attentive to isabel just as devoted to her as he can live he has followed her out here and he's at present in london i don't know his address but i guess i can obtain it i've never heard of him said ralph well i suppose you haven't heard of every one i don't believe he has ever heard of you but that's no reason why isabel shouldn't marry him ralph gave a mild ambiguous laugh what a rage you have for marrying people do you remember how you wanted to marry me the other day i've got over that you don't know how to take such ideas mr goodwood does however and that's what i like about him he's a splendid man and a perfect gentleman and isabel knows it 
Is she very fond of him? If she isn't, she ought to be. He's simply wrapped up in her. And you wish me to ask him here, said Ralph reflectively. It would be an act of true hospitality. Casper Goodwood, Ralph continued. It's rather a striking name. I don't care anything about his name. It might be Ezekiel Jenkins, and I should say the same. He's the only man I have ever seen whom I think worthy of Isabel. You're a very devoted friend, said Ralph. Of course I am. If you say that to pour scorn on me, I don't care. I don't say it to pour scorn on you. I'm very much struck with it. You're more satiric than ever, but I advise you not to laugh at Mr. Goodwood. I assure you I'm very serious. You ought to understand that, said Ralph. In a moment his companion understood it. I believe you are. Now you're too serious. You're difficult to please. Oh, you're very serious indeed. You won't invite Mr. Goodwood. I don't know, said Ralph. I'm capable of strange things. Tell me a little about Mr. Goodwood. What's he like? He's just the opposite of you. He's at the head of a cotton factory, a very fine one. Has he pleasant manners? asked Ralph. Splendid manners, in the American style. Would he be an agreeable member of our little circle? I don't think he'd care much about our little circle. He'd concentrate on Isabel. And how would my cousin like that? Very possibly not at all. But it will be good for her. It will call back her thoughts. Call them back? From where? From foreign parts and other unnatural places. Three months ago she gave Mr. Goodwood every reason to suppose he was acceptable to her, and it's not worthy of Isabel to go back on a real friend simply because she has changed the scene. I've changed the scene, too, and the effect of it has been to make me care more for my old associations than ever. It's my belief that the sooner Isabel changes it back again, the better. I know her well enough to know that she would never be truly happy over here and I wish her to form some strong American tie that will act as a preservative. "'Aren't you perhaps a little too much in a hurry?' Ralph inquired. "'Don't you think you ought to give her more of a chance in poor old England?' "'A chance to ruin her bright young life? One's never too much in a hurry to save a precious human creature from drowning.' "'As I understand it, then,' said Ralph, you wish me to push Mr. Goodwood overboard after her. Do you know, he added, that I've never heard her mention his name? Henrietta gave a brilliant smile. I'm delighted to hear that. It proves how much she thinks of him. Ralph appeared to allow that there was a good deal in this, and he surrendered to thought while his companion watched him askance. If I should invite Mr. Goodwood, he finally said, it would be to quarrel with him. Don't do that. He'd prove the better man. You certainly are doing your best to make me hate him. I really don't think I can ask him. I should be afraid of being rude to him. It's as you please, Henrietta returned. I had no idea you were in love with her yourself. Do you really believe that? The young man asked with lifted eyebrows. That's the most natural speech I've ever heard you make. Of course I believe it, Miss Stackpole ingeniously said. Well, Ralph concluded, to prove to you that you're wrong, I'll invite him. It must be, of course, as a friend of yours. It will not be as a friend of mine that he'll come, and it will not be to prove to me that I'm wrong that you'll ask him, but to prove it to yourself. These last words of Miss Stackpole's on which the two presently separated, contained an amount of truth which Ralph Touchett was obliged to recognize, but it so far took the edge from too sharp a recognition that in spite of his suspecting it would be rather more indiscreet to keep than to break his promise, he wrote Mr. Goodwood a note of six lines, expressing the pleasure it would give Mr. Touchett the elder that he should join a little party at Garden Court of which Miss Stackpole was a valued member. Having sent his letter, to the care of a banker whom Henrietta suggested, he waited in some suspense. He had heard this fresh, formidable figure named for the first time. 
for when his mother had mentioned on her arrival that there was a story about the girl's having an admirer at home the idea had seemed deficient in reality and he had taken no pains to ask questions the answers to which would involve only the vague or the disagreeable now however the native admiration of which his cousin was the object had become more concrete it took the form of a young man who had followed her to london who was interested in a cotton mill and had manners in the most splendid of the american styles ralph had two theories about this intervener either his passion was a sentimental fiction of miss stackpole's there was always a sort of tacit understanding among women born of the solidarity of the sex that they should discover or invent lovers for each other in which case he was not to be feared and would probably not accept the invitation or else he would accept the invitation and in this event prove himself a creature too irrational to demand further consideration the latter clause of ralph's argument might have seemed incoherent but it embodied his conviction that if mr goodwood were interested in isabel in the serious manner described by miss stackpole he would not care to present himself at garden court on a summons from the latter lady on this supposition said ralph he must regard her as a thorn on the stem of his rose as an intercessor he must find her wanting in tact two days after he had sent his invitation he received a very short note from gaspar goodwood thanking him for it regretting that other engagements made a visit to garden court impossible and presenting many compliments to miss stackpole ralph handed the note to henrietta who when she had read it exclaimed well i never have heard of anything so stiff i'm afraid he doesn't care so much about my cousin as you suppose ralph observed no it's not that it's some subtler motive his nature's very deep but i'm determined to fathom it and i shall write to him to know what he means his refusal of ralph's overtures was vaguely disconcerting from the moment he declined to come to garden court our friend began to think of him of importance he asked himself what it signified to him whether isabel's admirers should be desperados or laggards they were not rivals of his and were perfectly welcome to act out their genius nevertheless he felt much curiosity as to the result of miss stackpole's promised inquiry into the causes of mr goodwood's stiffness a curiosity for the present ungratified inasmuch as when he asked her three days later if she had written to london she was obliged to confess she had written in vain mr goodwood had not replied i suppose he's thinking it over she said he thinks everything over he's not really at all impetuous but i'm accustomed to having my letters answered the same day she presently proposed to isabel at all events that they should make an excursion to london together if i must tell the truth she observed i'm not seeing much at this place and i shouldn't think you were either i've not even seen that aristocrat what's his name lord washburton he seems to let you severely alone lord warburton's coming to-morrow i happen to know replied her friend who had received a note from the master of lockley in answer to her own letter you'll have every opportunity of turning him inside out well he may do for one letter but what's one letter when you want to write fifty i've described all the scenery in this vicinity and raved about all the old women and donkeys you may say what you please scenery doesn't make a vital letter i must go back to london and get some impressions of real life i was there but three days before i came away and that's hardly time to get in touch as isabel on her journey from new york to garden court had seen even less of the british capital than this it appeared a happy suggestion of henrietta's that the two should go thither on a visit of pleasure the idea struck isabel as charming she was curious of the thick detail of london which had always loomed large and rich to her they turned over their schemes together and indulged in visions of romantic hours they would stay at some picturesque old inn one of the inns described by dickens 
and drive over the town in those delightful hansoms. Henrietta was a literary woman, and the great advantage of being a literary woman was that you could go everywhere and do everything. They would dine at a coffee-house and go afterwards to the play. They would frequent the Abbey and the British Museum, and find out where Dr. Johnson had lived, and Goldsmith and Addison. Isabel grew eager, and presently unveiled the bright vision to Ralph, who burst into a fit of laughter which scarce expressed the sympathy she had desired. "'It's a delightful plan,' he said. "'I advise you to go to the Duke's Head in Covent Garden, an easy, informal, old-fashioned place, and I'll have you put down at my club.' "'Do you mean it's improper?' Isabel asked. "'Dear me, isn't anything proper here? With Henrietta surely I may go anywhere. She isn't hampered in that way.' She has travelled over the whole American continent, and can at least find her way about this minute island. "'Ah, then,' said Ralph, "'let me take advantage of her protection to go up to town as well. I may never have a chance to travel so safely.'" End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Stackpole would have prepared to start immediately, but Isabel, as we have seen, had been notified that Lord Warburton would come again to Garden Court, and she believed it her duty to remain there and see him. For four or five days he had made no response to her letter. Then he had written very briefly to say he would come to luncheon two days later. There was something in these delays and postponements that touched the girl, and renewed her sense of his desire to be considerate and patient, not to appear to urge her too grossly, a consideration the more studied that she was so sure he really liked her. Isabel told her uncle she had written to him, mentioning also his intention of coming, and the old man in consequence left his room earlier than usual, and made his appearance at the two o'clock repast. This was by no means an act of vigilance on his part, but the fruit of a benevolent belief that his being of the company might help to cover any conjoined straying away, in case Isabel should give their noble visitor another hearing. That personage drove over from Lockley, and brought the elder of his sisters with him, a measure presumably dictated by reflections of the same order as Mr. Touchett's. The two visitors were introduced to Miss Stackpole, who, at luncheon, occupied a seat adjoining Lord Warburton's. Isabel, who was nervous and had no relish for the prospect of again arguing the question he had so prematurely opened, could not help admiring his good-humoured self-possession, which quite disguised the symptoms of that preoccupation with her presence it was only natural she should suppose him to feel. He neither looked at her nor spoke to her, and the only sign of his emotion was that he avoided meeting her eyes. He had plenty of talk for the others, however, and he appeared to eat his luncheon with discrimination and appetite. Miss Molyneux, who had a smooth, nun-like forehead, and wore a large silver cross suspended from her neck, was evidently preoccupied with Henrietta Stackpole upon whom her eyes constantly rested in a manner suggesting a conflict between deep alienation and yearning wonder. Of the two ladies from Lockley she was the one Isabel had liked best. There was such a world of hereditary quiet in her. Isabel was sure, moreover, that her mild forehead and silver cross referred to some weird Anglican mystery, some delightful reinstitution, perhaps, of the quaint office of the canoness. She wondered what Miss Molyneux would think of her if she knew Miss Archer had refused her brother, and then she felt sure that Miss Molyneux would never know, that Lord Warburton never told her such things. He was fond of her and kind to her, but on the whole he told her little. Such at least was Isabel's theory, when, at table, she was not occupied in conversation, she was usually occupied in forming theories about her neighbours. According to Isabel, if Miss Molyneux should ever learn what had passed between Miss Archer and Lord Warburton, 
she would probably be shocked at such a girl's failure to rise or no rather this was our heroine's last position she would impute to the young american but a due consciousness of inequality whatever isabel might have made of her opportunities at all events henrietta stackpole was by no means disposed to neglect those in which she now found herself immersed do you know you're the first lord i've ever seen she said very promptly to her neighbour i suppose you think i'm awfully benighted you've escaped seeing some very ugly men lord warburton answered looking a trifle absently about the table are they very ugly they try to make us believe in america that they're all handsome and magnificent and that they wear wonderful robes and crowns ah the robes and crowns are gone out of fashion said lord warburton like your tomahawks and revolvers i'm sorry for that i think an aristocracy ought to be splendid henrietta declared if it's not that what is it oh you know it isn't much at the best her neighbour allowed won't you have a potato i don't care much for these european potatoes i shouldn't know you from an ordinary american gentleman do talk to me as if i were one said lord warburton i don't see how you manage to get on without potatoes you must find so few things to eat over here henrietta was silent a little there was a chance he was not sincere i've had hardly any appetite since i've been here she went on at last so it doesn't much matter i don't approve of you you know i feel as if i ought to tell you that don't approve of me yes i don't suppose any one ever said such a thing to you before did they i don't approve of lords as an institution i think the world has got beyond them far beyond oh so do i i don't approve of myself in the least sometimes it comes over me how should i object to myself if i were not myself don't you know but that's rather good by the way not to be vainglorious why don't you give it up then miss stackpole inquired give up a uh, asked lord warburton meeting her harsh inflection with a very mellow one give up being a lord oh i'm so little of one one would really forget all about it if you wretched americans were not constantly reminding one however i do think of giving it up the little there is left of it one of these days i should like to see you do it henrietta exclaimed rather grimly i'll invite you to the ceremony we'll have a supper and a dance well said miss stackpole i like to see all sides i don't approve of a privileged class but i like to hear what they have to say for themselves mighty little as you see i should like to draw you out a little more henrietta continued but you're always looking away you're afraid of meeting my eye i see you want to escape me no i'm only looking for those despised potatoes please explain about that young lady your sister then i don't understand about her is she a lady she's a capital good girl i don't like the way you say that as if you wanted to change the subject is her position inferior to yours we neither of us have any position to speak of but she's better off than i because she has none of the bother yes she doesn't look as if she had much bother i wish i had as little bother as that you do produce quiet people over here whatever else you may do ah uh, you see one takes life easily on the whole said lord warburton and then you know we're very dull ah uh, we can be dull when we try i should advise you to try something else i shouldn't know what to talk to your sister about she looks so different is that silver cross a badge a badge a sign of rank lord warburton's glance had wandered a good deal but at this it met the gaze of his neighbour oh yes he answered in a moment the women go in for those things the silver cross is worn by the eldest daughters of viscounts which was his harmless revenge for having occasionally had his credulity too easily engaged in america after luncheon he proposed to isabel to come into the gallery and look at the pictures 
and though she knew he had seen the pictures twenty times, she complied without criticising this pretext. Her conscience now was very easy. Ever since she sent him her letter, she had felt particularly light of spirit. He walked slowly to the end of the gallery, staring at its contents and saying nothing. And then he suddenly broke out, "'I hoped you wouldn't write to me that way.' "'It was the only way, Lord Warburton,' said the girl. "'Do try and believe that.' "'If I could believe it, of course I should let you alone. "'But we can't believe by willing it, "'and I confess I don't understand. "'I could understand your disliking me, "'that I could understand well. "'But that you should admit you do—' "'What have I admitted?' Isabel interrupted, "'turning slightly pale. "'That you think me a good fellow, isn't that it?' She said nothing, and he went on. You don't seem to have any reason, and that gives me a sense of injustice. I have a reason, Lord Warburton. She said it in a tone that made his heart contract. I should very much like to know it. I'll tell you some day when there's more to show for it. Excuse my saying that in the meantime I must doubt of it. You make me very unhappy, said Isabel. I'm not sorry for that. It may help you to know how I feel. Will you kindly answer me a question? Isabel made no audible assent, but he apparently saw in her eyes something that gave him courage to go on. Do you prefer someone else? That's a question I'd rather not answer. Ah, you do, then, her suitor murmured with bitterness. The bitterness touched her, and she cried out, You're mistaken, I don't. He sat down on a bench, unceremoniously, doggedly, like a man in trouble, leaning his elbows on his knees and staring at the floor. "'I can't even be glad of that,' he said at last, throwing himself back against the wall, "'for that would be an excuse.' She raised her eyebrows in surprise. "'An excuse? Must I excuse myself?' He paid, however, no answer to the question. Another idea had come into his head. Is it my political opinions? Do you think I go too far? I can't object to your political opinions, because I don't understand them. You don't care what I think, he cried, getting up. It's all the same to you. Isabel walked to the other side of the gallery, and stood there, showing him her charming back, her light slim figure, the length of her white neck as she bent her head, and the density of her dark braids. She stopped in front of a small picture, as if for the purpose of examining it, and there was something so young and free in her movement that her very pliancy seemed to mock at him. Her eyes, however, saw nothing. They had suddenly been suffused with tears. In a moment he followed her, and by this time she had brushed her tears away. But when she turned round her face was pale, and the expression of her eyes strange. That reason that I wouldn't tell you, I'll tell you it after all. It's that I can't escape my fate. Your fate? I should try to escape it if I were to marry you. I don't understand. Why should not that be your fate as well as anything else? Because it's not, said Isabel, femininely. I know it's not. It's not my fate to give up. I know it can't be. Poor Lord Warburton stared, an interrogative point in either eye. Do you call marrying me giving up? Not in the usual sense. It's getting, getting, getting a great deal. But it's giving up other chances. Other chances for what? I don't mean chances to marry, said Isabel, her colour quickly coming back to her. And then she stopped, looking down with a deep frown, as if it were hopeless to attempt to make her meaning clear. "'I don't think it presumptuous in me to suggest that you'll gain more than you'll lose,' her companion observed. "'I can't escape unhappiness,' said Isabel. "'In marrying you, I shall be trying to.' "'I don't know whether you'd try to, but you certainly would. That I must in candour admit,' he exclaimed with an anxious laugh. I mustn't, I can't, cried the girl. Well, if you're bent on being miserable, I don't see why you should make me so. 
whatever charms a life of misery may have for you it has none for me i'm not bent on a life of misery said isabel i've always been intensely determined to be happy and i've often believed i should be i've told people that you can ask them but it comes over me every now and then that i can never be happy in any extraordinary way not by turning away by separating myself by separating yourself from what from life from the usual changes and dangers what most people know and suffer lord warburton broke into a smile that almost denoted hope why my dear miss archer he began to explain with the most considerate eagerness i don't offer you any exoneration from life or from chances or dangers whatever i wish i could depend upon it i would for what do you take me pray heaven help me i'm not the emperor of china all i offer you is the chance of taking the common lot in a comfortable sort of way the common lot why i'm devoted to the common lot strike an alliance with me and i promise you that you shall have plenty of it you shall separate yourself from nothing whatever not even from your friend miss stackpole she'd never approve of it said isabel trying to smile and take advantage of this side issue despising herself too not a little for doing so are we speaking of miss stackpole his lordship asked impatiently i never saw a person judge things on such theoretic grounds now i suppose you're speaking of me said isabel with humility and she turned away again for she saw miss molyneux enter the gallery accompanied by henrietta and by ralph lord warburton's sister addressed him with a certain timidity and reminded him she ought to return home in time for tea as she was expecting company to partake of it he made no answer apparently not having heard her he was preoccupied and with good reason miss molyneux as if he had been royalty stood like a lady in waiting well i never miss molyneux said henrietta stackpole if i wanted to go he'd have to go if i wanted my brother to do a thing he'd have to do it oh warburton does everything one wants miss molyneux answered with a quick shy laugh how very many pictures you have she went on turning to ralph they look a good many because they're all put together said ralph but it's really a bad way oh i think it's so nice i wish we had a gallery at lockley i'm so very fond of pictures miss molyneux went on persistently to ralph as if she were afraid miss stackpole would address her again henrietta appeared at once to fascinate and to frighten her ah yes pictures are very convenient said ralph who appeared to know better what style of reflection was acceptable to her they're so very pleasant when it rains the young lady continued it has rained of late so very often i'm sorry you're going away lord warburton said henrietta i wanted to get a great deal more out of you i'm not going away lord warburton answered your sister says you must in america the gentlemen obey the ladies i'm afraid we have some people to tea said miss molyneux looking at her brother very good my dear we'll go i hoped you would resist henrietta exclaimed i wanted to see what miss molyneux would do i never do anything said this young lady i suppose in your position it's sufficient for you to exist miss stackpole returned i should like very much to see you at home you must come to lockley again said miss molyneux very sweetly to isabel ignoring this remark of isabel's friend isabel looked into her, her quiet eyes a moment and for that moment seemed to see in their grey depths the reflection of everything she had rejected in rejecting lord warburton the peace the kindness the honour the possessions a deep security and a great exclusion she kissed miss molyneux and then she said i'm afraid i can never come again never again i'm afraid i'm going away oh i'm so very sorry said miss molyneux i think that's so very wrong of you lord warburton watched this little passage then he turned away and stared at a picture ralph leaning against the rail before the picture with his hands in his pockets 
had for the moment been watching him. "'I should like to see you at home,' said Henrietta, whom Lord Warburton found beside him. "'I should like an hour's talk with you. There are a great many questions I wish to ask you.' "'I shall be delighted to see you,' the proprietor of Lockley answered. "'But I'm certain not to be able to answer many of your questions. When will you come?' "'Whenever Miss Archer will take me. We're thinking of going to London, but we'll go and see you first. I'm determined to get some satisfaction out of you. If it depends upon Miss Archer, I'm afraid you won't get much. She won't come to Lockley. She doesn't like the place. She told me it was lovely, said Henrietta. Lord Warburton hesitated. She won't come all the same. You had better come alone, he added. Henrietta straightened herself, and her large eyes expanded. "'Would you make that remark to an English lady?' she inquired with soft asperity. Lord Warburton stared. "'Yes, if I liked her enough.' "'You'd be careful not to like her enough. If Miss Archer won't visit your place again, it's because she doesn't want to take me. I know what she thinks of me, and I suppose you think the same, that I oughtn't to bring in individuals.' Lord Warburton was at a loss. He had not been made acquainted with Miss Stackpole's professional character, and failed to catch her allusion. "'Miss Archer has been warning you,' she therefore went on. "'Warning me? Isn't that why she came off alone with you here, to put you on your guard?' "'Oh, dear, no,' said Lord Warburton brazenly. "'Our talk had no such solemn character as that.' "'Well, you've been on your guard intensely.' I suppose it's natural to you, that's just what I wanted to observe. And so, too, Miss Molyneux, she wouldn't commit herself. You have been warned anyway, Henrietta continued, addressing this young lady. But for you it wasn't necessary. I hope not, said Miss Molyneux vaguely. Miss Stackpole takes notes, Ralph soothingly explained. She's a great satirist. She sees through us all and she works us up. "'Well, I must say, I never have had such a collection of bad material,' Henrietta declared, looking from Isabel to Lord Warburton, and from this nobleman to his sister and to Ralph. "'There's something the matter with you all. You're as dismal as if you had got a bad cable.' "'You do see through us, Miss Stackpole,' said Ralph, in a low tone, giving her a little intelligent nod as he led the party out of the gallery." There's something the matter with us all. Isabel came behind these two. Miss Molyneux, who decidedly liked her immensely, had taken her arm to walk beside her over the polished floor. Lord Warburton strolled on the other side with his hands behind him and his eyes lowered. For some moments he said nothing, and then, Is it true you're going to London? he asked. I believe it has been arranged. "'And when shall you come back?' "'In a few days, but probably for a very short time. "'I'm going to Paris with my aunt. "'When, then, shall I see you again?' "'Not for a good while,' said Isabel. "'But some day or other, I hope.' "'Do you really hope it?' "'Very much.' He went a few steps in silence. Then he stopped and put out his hand. "'Good-bye.' "'Good-bye,' said Isabel.' Miss Molyneux kissed her again, and she let the two depart. After it, without rejoining Henrietta and Ralph, she retreated to her own room, in which apartment before dinner she was found by Mrs. Touchett, who had stopped on her way to the saloon. "'I may as well tell you,' said that lady, "'that your uncle has informed me of your relations with Lord Warburton.' Isabel considered. "'Relations? They're hardly relations.' That's the strange part of it. He has seen me but three or four times. Why did you tell your uncle rather than me? Miss Touchett dispassionately asked. Again the girl hesitated. Because he knows Lord Warburton better. Yes, but I know you better. I'm not sure of that, said Isabel, smiling. Neither am I, after all, especially when you give me that rather conceited look. One would think you were awfully pleased with yourself, and had carried off a prize. I suppose that when you refuse an offer like Lord Warburton's, it's because you expect to do something better. 
ah my uncle didn't say that cried isabel smiling still end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the portrait of a lady by henry james the sleeper box recording is in the public domain it had been arranged that the two young ladies should proceed to london under ralph's escort though mrs touchett looked with little favour on the plan it was just the sort of plan she said that miss stackpole would be sure to suggest and she inquired if the correspondent of the interviewer was to take the party to stay at her favourite boarding-house i don't care where she takes us to stay so long as there's local colour said isabel that's what we're going to london for i suppose that after a girl has refused an english lord she may do anything her aunt rejoined after that one needn't stand on trifles should you have liked me to marry lord warburton isabel inquired of course i should i thought you disliked the english so much so i do but it's all the greater reason for making use of them is that your idea of marriage and isabel ventured to add that her aunt appeared to her to have made very little use of mr touchett your uncle's not an english nobleman said mrs touchett though even if he had been i should still probably have taken up my residence in florence do you think lord warburton could make me any better than i am the girl asked with some animation i don't mean i'm too good to improve i mean i mean that i don't love lord warburton enough to marry him you did right to refuse him then said mrs touchett in her smallest sparest voice only the next great offer you get i hope you'll manage to come up to your standard we had better wait until the offer comes before we talk about it i hope very much i may have no more offers for the present they upset me completely you probably won't be troubled with them if you adopt permanently the bohemian manner of life however i've promised ralph not to criticize i'll do whatever ralph says is right isabel returned i've unbounded confidence in ralph his mother's much obliged to you this lady dryly laughed it seems to me indeed she ought to feel it isabel irrepressibly answered ralph had assured her that there would be no violation of decency in their paying a visit the little party of three to the sights of the metropolis but mrs touchett took a different view like many ladies of her country who had lived a long time in europe she had completely lost her native tact on such points and in her reaction not in itself deplorable against the liberty allowed to young persons beyond the seas had fallen into gratuitous and exaggerated scruples ralph accompanied their visitors to town and established them at a quiet inn in a street that ran at right angles to piccadilly his first idea had been to take them to his father's house in winchester square a large dull mansion which at this period of the year was shrouded in silence and brown holland but he bethought himself that the cook being at garden court there was no one in the house to get them their meals and pratt's hotel accordingly became their resting-place ralph on his side found quarters in winchester square having a den there of which he was very fond and being familiar with deeper fears than that of a cold kitchen he availed himself largely indeed of the resources of pratt's hotel beginning his day with an early visit to his fellow travellers who had mr pratt in person in a large bulging white waistcoat to remove their dish covers ralph turned up as he said after breakfast and the little party made out a scheme of entertainment for the day as london wears in the month of september a face blank but for its smears of prior service the young man who occasionally took an apologetic tone was obliged to remind his companion to miss stackpole's high derision that there wasn't a creature in town i suppose you mean the aristocracy are absent henry answered but i don't think you could have a better proof that if they were absent altogether they wouldn't be missed it seems to me the place is about as full as it can be there's no one here of course but three or four millions of people 
What is it you call them, the lower middle class? They're only the population of London, and that's of no consequence. Ralph declared that for him the aristocracy left no void that Miss Stackpole herself didn't fill, and that a more contented man was nowhere at that moment to be found. In this he spoke the truth, for the stale September days, in the huge half-empty town, had a charm wrapped in them as a coloured gem might be wrapped in a dusty cloth. When he went home at night to the empty house in Winchester Square, after a chain of hours with his comparatively ardent friends, he wandered into the big dusky dining-room, where the candle he took from the hall-table, after letting himself in, constituted the only illumination. The square was still, the house was still. When he raised one of the windows of the dining-room to let in the air, he heard the slow creak of the boots of a lone constable. His own step in the empty place seemed loud and sonorous. Some of the carpets had been raised, and whenever he moved he roused a melancholy echo. He sat down in one of the armchairs. The big, dark dining-table twinkled here and there in the small candlelight. The pictures on the wall, all of them very brown, looked vague and incoherent. There was a ghostly presence as of dinners long since digested, of table talk that had lost its actuality. This hint of the supernatural, perhaps, had something to do with the fact that his imagination took a flight, and that he remained in his chair a long time beyond the hour at which he should have been in bed, doing nothing, not even reading the evening paper. I say he did nothing, and I maintain the phrase in the face of the fact that he thought at these moments of Isabel. To think of Isabel could only be for him an idle pursuit, leading to nothing, and profiting little to any one. His cousin had not yet seemed to him so charming, as during these days spent in sounding, tourist fashion, the deeps and shallows of the metropolitan element. Isabel was full of premises, conclusions, emotions. If she had come in search of local colour, she found it everywhere. She asked more questions than he could answer, and launched brave theories as to historic cause and social effect that he was equally unable to accept or to refute. The party went more than once to the British Museum, and to that brighter palace of art, which reclaims for antique variety so large an area of a monotonous suburb. They spent a morning in the Abbey, and went on a penny steamer to the Tower. They looked at pictures both in public and private collections, and sat on various occasions beneath the great trees in Kensington Gardens. Henrietta proved an indestructible sightseer, and a more lenient judge than Ralph had ventured to hope. She had indeed many disappointments, and London at large suffered from her vivid remembrance of the strong points of the American civic idea. But she made the best of its dingy dignities, and only heaved an occasional sigh, and uttered a desultory, well, which led no further, and lost itself in retrospect. The truth was that, as she said to herself, she was not in her element. "'I've not a sympathy with inanimate objects,' she remarked to Isabel at the National Gallery, and she continued to suffer from the meagreness of the glimpse that had as yet been vouchsafed to her of the inner life. Landscapes by Turner and Assyrian bulls were a poor substitute for the literary dinner-parties at which she had hoped to meet the genius and renown of Great Britain. "'Where are your public men? Where are your men and women of intellect?' she inquired of Ralph, standing in the middle of Trafalgar Square, as if she had supposed this to be a place where she would naturally meet a few. "'That's one of them on top of the column, you say.' Lord Nelson, was he a lord too? Wasn't he high enough that they had to stick him a hundred feet in the air? That's the past. I don't care about the past. I want to see some of the leading minds of the present. I won't say of the future, because I don't believe much in your future. Poor Ralph had a few leading minds among his acquaintance, and rarely enjoyed the pleasure of buttonholing a celebrity a state of things which appeared to Miss Stackpole to indicate a deplorable want of enterprise. 
"'If I were on the other side, I should call,' she said, "'and tell the gentleman, whoever he might be, "'that I had heard a great deal about him "'and had come to see for myself. "'But I gather from what you say "'that this is not the custom here. "'You seem to have plenty of meaningless customs, "'but none of those that would help along. "'We are in advance, certainly. "'I suppose I shall have to give up the social side altogether.' and Henrietta, though she went about with her guide-book and pencil, and wrote a letter to the interviewer about the tower, in which she described the execution of Lady Jane Grey, had a sad sense of falling below her mission. The incident that had preceded Isabel's departure from Garden Court left a painful trace in our young woman's mind, when she felt again in her face, as from a recurrent wave, the cold breath of her last suitor's surprise, she could only muffle her head till the air cleared. She could not have done less than what she did, this was certainly true. But her necessity, all the same, had been as graceless as some physical act in a strained attitude, and she felt no desire to take credit for her conduct. Mixed with this imperfect pride, nevertheless, was a feeling of freedom which in itself was sweet, and which, as she wandered through the great city with her ill-matched companions, occasionally throbbed into odd demonstrations. When she walked in Kensington Gardens, she stopped the children, mainly of the poorer sort, whom she saw playing on the grass. She asked them their names and gave them sixpence, and when they were pretty, kissed them. Ralph noticed these quaint charities. He noticed everything she did. One afternoon, that his companions might pass the time, he invited them to tea in Winchester Square, and he had the house set in order as much as possible for their visit. There was another guest to meet them, an amiable bachelor, an old friend of Ralph's, who happened to be in town, and for whom prompt commerce with Miss Stackpole appeared to have been neither difficulty nor dread. Mr. Bantling, a stout, sleek, smiling man of forty, wonderfully dressed, universally informed, and incoherently amused, laughed immoderately at everything Henrietta said, gave her several cups of tea, examined in her society the bric-a-brac of which Ralph had a considerable collection, and afterwards, when the host proposed they should go out into the square and pretend it was a fête champêtre, walked round the limited enclosure several times with her, and, at a dozen turns of their talk, bounded responsive, as with a positive passion for argument, to her remarks upon the inner life. "'Oh, I see. I dare say you found it very quiet at Garden Court. Naturally, there's not much going on there, when there's such a lot of illness about. Touchett's very bad, you know. The doctors have forbidden his being in England at all, and he has only come back to take care of his father.' The old man, I believe, has half a dozen things the matter with him. They call it gout, but to my certain knowledge he has organic disease so developed that you may depend upon it he'll go, some day soon, quite quickly. Of course that sort of thing makes a dreadfully dull house. I wonder they have people when they can do so little for them. Then I believe Mr. Touchett's always squabbling with his wife. She lives away from her husband, you know, in that extraordinary American way of yours. If you want a house where there's always something going on, I recommend you to go down and stay with my sister, Lady Pencil, in Bedfordshire. I'll write to her tomorrow, and I'm sure she'll be delighted to ask you. I know just what you want. You want a house where they go in for theatricals and picnics and that sort of thing. My sister's just that sort of woman. She's always getting up something or other, and she's always glad to have the sort of people who help her. I'm sure she'll ask you down by return of post. She's tremendously fond of distinguished people and writers. She writes herself, you know, but I haven't read everything she has written. It's usually poetry, and I don't go in much for poetry, unless it's Byron. I suppose you think a great deal of Byron in America, Mr. Bantling continued, expanding in the stimulating air of Miss Stackpole's attention, bringing up his sequences promptly, and changing his topic with an easy turn of hand. Yet he none the less gracefully kept in sight of the idea, 
dazzling to Henrietta, of her going to stay with Lady Pencil in Bedfordshire. I understand what you want. You want to see some genuine English sport. The Touchets aren't English at all, you know. They have their own habits, their own language, their own food, some odd religion even, I believe, of their own. The old man thinks it's wicked to hunt, I'm told. You must get down to my sister's in time for the theatricals, and I'm sure she'll be glad to give you a part. I'm sure you act well. I know you're very clever. My sister's forty years old and has seven children, but she's going to play the principal part. Plain as she is, she makes up awfully well, I will say for her. Of course, you needn't act if you don't want to. In this manner Mr. Bantling delivered himself while they strolled over the grass in Winchester Square, which, although it had been peppered by the London soot, invited the tread to linger. Henrietta thought her blooming, easy-voiced bachelor, with his impressibility to feminine merit and his splendid range of suggestion, a very agreeable man, and she valued the opportunity he offered her. I don't know, but I would go if your sister should ask me. I think it would be my duty. What do you call her name? Pencil. It's an odd name, but it isn't a bad one. I think one name's as good as another. But what's her rank? Oh, she's a baron's wife, a convenient sort of rank. You're fine enough, and you're not too fine. I don't know but what she'd be too fine for me. What do you call the place she lives in, Bedfordshire? She lives away in the northern corner of it. It's a tiresome country, but I dare say you won't mind it. I'll try and run down while you're there. All this was very pleasant to Miss Stackpole, and she was sorry to be obliged to be separate from Lady Pencil's obliging brother. But it happened that she had met the day before, in Piccadilly, some friends whom she had not seen for a year. The Miss Climbers, two ladies from Wilmington, Delaware, who had been travelling on the continent and were now preparing to re-embark. Henrietta had had a long interview with them on the Piccadilly pavement, and though the three ladies all talked at once, they had not exhausted their store. It had been agreed, therefore, that Henrietta should come and dine with them in their lodgings in German Street at six o'clock on the morrow, and she now bethought herself of this engagement. She prepared to start for German Street, taking leave first of Ralph Touchett and Isabel, who, seated on garden chairs in another part of the enclosure, were occupied, if the term may be used, with an exchange of amenities less pointed than the practical colloquy of Miss Stackpole and Mr. Bantling. When it had been settled between Isabel and her friend that they should be reunited at some reputable hour at Pratt's Hotel, Ralph remarked that the latter must have a cab. She couldn't walk all the way to German Street. "'I suppose you mean it's improper for me to walk alone?' Henrietta exclaimed. "'Merciful powers, have I come to this?' "'There's not the slightest need of your walking alone,' Mr. Bantling gaily interposed. "'I should be greatly pleased to go with you.' "'I simply meant that you'd be late for dinner,' Ralph returned. "'Those poor ladies may easily believe that we refuse at the last to spare you.' "'You had better have a hansom, Henrietta,' said Isabel. "'I'll get you a hansom if you'll trust me,' Mr. Bantling went on. "'We might walk a little till we meet one.' "'I don't see why I shouldn't trust him, do you?' Henrietta inquired of Isabel. "'I don't see what Mr. Bantling could do to you,' Isabel obligingly answered. "'But, if you like, we'll walk with you till you find your cab.' "'Never mind, we'll go alone. Come on, Mr. Bantling, and take care you get me a good one.' Mr. Bantling promised to do his best, and the two took their departure, leaving the girl and her cousin together in the square, over which a clear September twilight had now begun to gather. It was perfectly still, the wide quadrangle of dusky houses showed lights in none of the windows, where the shutters and blinds were closed, the pavements were a vacant expanse, and putting aside two small children from a neighbouring slum, who, attracted by symptoms of abnormal animation in the interior, poked their faces between the rusty rails of the enclosure, the most vivid object within sight was the big red pillar-post on the southeast corner. 
Henrietta will ask him to get into the cab and go with her to German Street, Ralph observed. He always spoke of Miss Stackpole as Henrietta. Very possibly, said his companion. Or rather, no, she won't, he went on, but Bantling will ask leave to get in. Very likely again. I'm very glad they're such good friends. She has made a conquest. He thinks her a brilliant woman. It may go far, said Ralph. Isabel was briefly silent. I call Henrietta a very brilliant woman, but I don't think it will go far. They would never really know each other. He has not the least idea what she really is, and she has no just comprehension of Mr. Bantling. There's no more usual basis of union than a mutual misunderstanding, but it ought not to be so difficult to understand Bob Bantling, Ralph added. He is a very simple organism. Yes, but Henrietta's a simpler one still. And pray, what am I to do? Isabel asked, looking about her through the fading light, in which the limited landscape gardening of the square took on a large and effective appearance. I don't imagine that you'll propose that you and I, for our amusement, shall drive about London in a hansom. There's no reason we shouldn't stay here, if you don't dislike it. It's very warm. There will be half an hour yet before dark, and if you permit, I'll light a cigarette. You may do as you please, said Isabel, if you'll amuse me till seven o'clock. I propose at that hour to go back and partake of a simple and solitary repast, two poached eggs and a muffin, at Pratt's Hotel. Mayn't I dine with you? Ralph asked. No, you'll dine at your club. They had wandered back to their chairs in the centre of the square again, and Ralph had lighted his cigarette. It would have given him extreme pleasure to be present in person at the modest little feast she had sketched, but in default of this he liked even being forbidden. For the moment, however, he liked immensely being alone with her, in the thickening dusk, at the centre of the multitudinous town. It made her seem to depend upon him and to be in his power. This power he could exert but vaguely. The best exercise of it was to accept her decision submissively, which indeed there was already an emotion in doing. "'Why won't you let me dine with you?' he demanded, after a pause. "'Because I don't care for it.' "'I suppose you're tired of me.' "'I shall be an hour hence. You see, I have the gift of foreknowledge.' "'Oh, I shall be delightful meanwhile,' said Ralph. But he said nothing more, and as she made no rejoinder, they sat some time in a stillness which seemed to contradict his promise of entertainment. It seemed to him she was preoccupied, and he wondered what she was thinking about. There were two or three very possible subjects. At last he spoke again. Is your objection to my society this evening caused by your expectation of another visitor? She turned her head with a glance of her clear, fair eyes. Another visitor? What visitor should I have? He had none to suggest, which made his question seem to himself silly as well as brutal. You've a great many friends that I don't know. You've a whole past from which I was perversely excluded. You were reserved for my future. You must remember that my past is over there across the water. There's none of it here in London. Very good, then, since your future is seated beside you. Capital thing to have your future so handy and Ralph lighted another cigarette, and reflected that Isabel probably meant she had received news that Mr. Casper Goodwood had crossed to Paris. After he had lighted his cigarette, he puffed it a while, and then he resumed. I promised just now to be very amusing, but you see I don't come up to the mark, and the fact is there's a good deal of temerity in one's undertaking to amuse a person like you. What do you care for my feeble attempts? You've grand ideas. You've a high standard in such matters. I ought at least to bring in a band of music, or a company of mountebanks. One mountebank's enough, and you do very well. Pray go on, and in another ten minutes I shall begin to laugh. I assure you I'm very serious, said Ralph. You do really ask a great deal. I don't know what you mean. I ask nothing. "'You accept nothing,' said Ralph. She coloured, and now suddenly it seemed to her that she guessed his meaning. But why should he speak to her of such things? 
He hesitated a little, and then he continued. There's something I should like very much to say to you. It's a question I wish to ask. It seems to me I've a right to ask it, because I've a kind of interest in the answer. Ask what you will, Isabel replied gently, and I'll try to satisfy you. Well, then, I hope you won't mind my saying that Warburton has told me of something that has passed between you. Isabel suppressed a start. She sat looking at her open fan. Very good. I suppose it was natural he should tell you. I have his leave to let you know he has done so. He has some hope still, said Ralph. Still? He had it a few days ago. I don't believe he has any now, said the girl. I'm very sorry for him, then. He's such an honest man. Pray, did he ask you to talk to me? No, not that. But he told me because he couldn't help it. We're old friends, and he was greatly disappointed. He sent me a line asking me to come and see him, and I drove over to Lockley the day before he and his sister lunched with us. He was very heavy-hearted. He had just got a letter from you. Did he show you the letter? asked Isabel, with momentary loftiness. By no means, but he told me it was a neat refusal. I was very sorry for him, Ralph repeated. For some moments Isabel said nothing, then at last. Do you know how often he had seen me, she inquired? Five or six times. That's to your glory. It's not for that I say it. What then do you say it for? Not to prove that poor Warburton's state of mind superficial, because I'm pretty sure you don't think that. Isabel certainly was unable to say what she thought, but presently she said something else. If you've not been requested by Lord Warburton to argue with me, then you're doing it disinterestedly, or for the love of argument. I've no wish to argue with you at all. I only wish to leave you alone. I'm simply greatly interested in your sentiments. I'm greatly obliged to you, cried Isabel, with a slightly nervous laugh. Of course you mean that I'm meddling in what doesn't concern me. But why shouldn't I speak to you of this matter without annoying you or embarrassing yourself? What's the use of being your cousin if I can't have a few privileges? What's the use of adoring you without hope of a reward if I can't have a few compensations? What's the use of being ill and disabled and restricted to mere spectatorship at the game of life if I really can't see the show when I've paid so much for my ticket? Tell me this. Ralph went on, while she listened to him, with quickened attention. What had you in mind when you refused Lord Warburton? What had I in mind? What was the logic, the view of your situation, that dictated so remarkable an act? I didn't wish to marry him, if that's logic. No, that's not logic, and I knew that before. It's really nothing you know. What was it you said to yourself? You certainly said more than that. Isabel reflected a moment, then answered with a question of her own. Why do you call it a remarkable act? That's what your mother thinks, too. Warburton's such a thorough good sort. As a man, I consider he has hardly a fault. And then he's what they call here no end of a swell. He has immense possessions, and his wife would be thought a superior being. He unites the intrinsic and the extrinsic advantages. Isabel watched her cousin, as to see how far he would go. I refused him because he was too perfect then. I'm not perfect myself, and he's too good for me. Besides, his perfection would irritate me. That's ingenious rather than candid, said Ralph. As a fact, you think nothing in the world too perfect for you. Do you think I'm so good? No, but you're exacting all the same, without the excuse of thinking yourself good. Nineteen women out of twenty, however, even of the most exacting sort, would have managed to do with Warburton. Perhaps you don't know how he has been stalked. I don't wish to know, but it seems to me, said Isabel, that one day when we talked of him you mentioned odd things to him. Ralph smokingly considered. I hope that what I said then had no weight with you, for they were not false, the things I spoke of, they were simply peculiarities of his position. 
If I had known he wished to marry you, I'd never have alluded to them. I think I said that as regards that position, he was rather a sceptic. It would have been in your power to make him a believer. I think not. I don't understand the matter, and I'm not conscious of any mission of that sort. You're evidently disappointed, Isabel added, looking at her cousin with rueful gentleness. You'd have liked me to make such a marriage. Not in the least. I'm absolutely without a wish on the subject. I don't pretend to advise you, and I content myself with watching you with the deepest interest. She gave rather a conscious sigh. I wish I could be as interesting to myself as I am to you. There, you're not candid again. You're extremely interesting to yourself. Do you know, however, said Ralph, that if you've really given Warburton his final answer, I'm rather glad it has been what it was. I don't mean I'm glad for you, and still less, of course, for him. I'm glad for myself. Are you thinking of proposing to me? By no means. From the point of view I speak of, that would be fatal. I should kill the goose that supplies me with the material of my inimitable omelettes. I use that animal as the symbol of my insane illusions. What I mean is that I shall have the thrill of seeing what a young lady does who won't marry Lord Warburton. That's what your mother counts upon, too, said Isabel. Ah, there will be plenty of spectators. We shall hang on the rest of your career. I shall not see all of it, but I shall probably see the most interesting years. Of course, if you were to marry our friend, you'd still have a career. A very decent, in fact, a very brilliant one. But relatively speaking, it would be a little prosaic. It would be definitely marked out in advance. It would be wanting in the unexpected. You know, I'm extremely fond of the unexpected. And now that you've kept the game in your hands, I depend on your giving us some grand example of it. I don't understand you very well, said Isabel, but I do so well enough to be able to say that if you look for grand examples of anything from me, I shall disappoint you. You'll do so only by disappointing yourself, and that will go hard with you. To this she made no direct reply. There was an amount of truth in it that would bear consideration. At last she said abruptly, I don't see what harm there is in my wishing not to tie myself. I don't want to begin life by marrying. There are other things a woman can do. There's nothing she can do so well. But you're, of course, many-sided. If one's two-sided, it's enough, said Isabel. You're the most charming of polygons, her companion broke out. At the glance from his companion, however, he became grave, and to prove it went on. You want to see life. You'll be hanged if you don't, as the young men say. I don't think I want to see it as the young men want to see it, but I do want to look about me. You want to drain the cup of experience. No, I don't wish to touch the cup of experience. It's a poisoned drink. I only want to see for myself. You want to see, but not to feel, Ralph remarked. I don't think that if one's a sentient being, one can make the distinction. I'm a good deal like Henrietta. The other day when I asked her if she wished to marry, she said, Not till I've seen Europe. I, too, don't wish to marry till I've seen Europe. You evidently expect a crowned head will be struck with you. No, that would be worse than marrying Lord Warburton. But it's getting very dark, Isabel continued, and I must go home. She rose from her place, but Ralph only sat still and looked at her. As he remained there, she stopped, and they exchanged a gaze that was full on either side, but especially on Ralph's, of utterances too vague for words. "'You've answered my question,' he said at last. "'You've told me what I wanted. I'm greatly obliged to you.' "'It seems to me I've told you very little. "'You've told me the great thing, that the world interests you, "'and that you want to throw yourself into it.' "'Her silvery eyes shone a moment in the dusk. "'I never said that. "'I think you meant it. Don't repudiate it. It's so fine.' 
I don't know what you're trying to fasten upon me, for I'm not in the least an adventurous spirit. Women are not like men. Ralph slowly rose from his seat, and they walked together to the gate of the square. No, he said, women rarely boast of their courage. Men do, with a certain frequency. Men have it to boast of. Women have it, too. You've a great deal. Enough to go home in a cab to Pratt's hotel, but not more. Ralph unlocked the gate, and after they had passed out he fastened it. We'll find your cab, he said, and as they turned towards the neighbouring street in which this quest might avail, he asked her again if he mightn't see her safely to the inn. By no means, she answered, you're very tired, you must go home and go to bed. The cab was found, and he helped her into it, standing a moment at the door. "'When people forget I'm a poor creature, I'm often incommoded,' he said. "'But it's worse when they remember it.'" End of chapter 15